The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to E1 installation training. I'm Will Stradling of Seward Equipment and I'll be your moderator. Today's presenter is Jim Welsh of Seward Equipment. Today's presentation is approved for level one E1 certified installation training. To receive credit, each participant must be registered for the webinar. You can download the certificate of completion now on the GoToWebinar dashboard. Print it, fill in your name, and retain a copy for your files. Also, you can download a copy of this presentation. To become a Level 2 E1 certified installer, you must request a login username and password information to take an exam. The exam is 20 questions, multiple choice. You can send me an email to willstradling at seawardequipment.com to request more information. Only level two installers will be on our list of certified installers and will be provided to people that ask for a list of referrals. During the presentation, you can submit questions on the GoToWebinar dashboard and we will do our best to answer them during or at the end of the presentation. Every Tuesday in April, Seward Equipment is offering free webinars beginning at noon. Please check your email, follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn for more details. Now over to you, Jim. Good morning, everybody. I promise that was not a pre-recorded Will Stradling speech. He is actually here to answer questions and to help me should I need somebody to jump in. Uh, so a little housekeeping on my part. Um, I am at Seaward Equipment. You guys are going to be seeing some videos that uh, show me, Jim Welsh, as an E1 field service associate. Um, I was there for about eight years, so uh, there's definitely some throwback videos that are going to give guidance on certain product styles that we're going to be talking about during today's presentation. Also, this is uh, not going to be a super formal presentation, so we're here for you. Uh, we have a pre-recorded agenda. But if there's anything anybody wants to specifically talk about, drop it in chat, and then one of the moderators will uh, jump in, ask the question, we'll get it answered, and uh, we'll make sure you guys get all of your needs satisfied during this presentation. Uh, another side note is that we're all working from home now, at least most people. So I've been told by the internet, you're supposed to refer to dogs and children as coworkers. So if I get any unnecessary interruptions from my coworkers, I apologize. And you will also hear, Vanessa, this is a shout out to you, bad dad jokes. Uh, I'm really great at that. There's one easy way to make them better, add Bailey's to your coffee. The more Bailey's, the better my bad dad jokes will be. All right, guys, agenda time. So like I said, informal, this is the, uh, the standard kind of speech that we put on for any sort of an E1 installation training. I've done this quite a few times over the past eight years. And uh, it's been a little bit, so if I'm out of practice, I apologize. Uh, but this is it, the overview. That's just talking generally about the product type, tanks, pumps, panels, et cetera. Uh, the installation inspection, uh, how we're gonna set up for success during an installation uh, kind of operation. The ballasting options, uh, inlet configurations, as well as discharge, proper inlet and discharge configurations. Um, at that point, we'll probably park for a quick second to talk about some additional things that Seaward offers above and beyond um, what uh, E1, the manufacturer, would be providing in terms of product. Uh, from there, we'll talk about electrical. This is where we're going to touch just a hair on troubleshooting. Um, in the, uh, the New England states, the Northeast specifically, I've seen contractors, installers do a good bit more um, upfront work in terms of like startup pre-startup inspections or just uh, generic troubleshooting in the event that something isn't functioning as uh, as per manufacturer's recommendation. So we're going to do a little bit of troubleshooting talk. Um, then we'll finish up with uh, the panel section and then talk backfill and height adjustments at the end. Um, again, if anybody needs breaks, uh, we're going to have some in here. It's a two hour presentation, so um, I'll definitely need to re-up on coffee at some point. So we'll let you guys jump in and let us know if uh, multiple people need to just peel off for a couple of minutes. And again, use the chat box. Uh, Will brought it up already, handouts. Uh, under the panel for the go-to meeting, you'll see handouts, installation training event. That's a PowerPoint presentation that you guys can download. Um, 
PDF version of it uh, to either follow along or keep it for your records, as well as your level one certified installer certificate. So quick clarifications on level one versus level two. Level one means you've been trained, not that you are certified. Um, as Will mentioned, the level two is certified installer, and that's through uh, E1. That's CoreSites.com, and you can't just jump on the website and, and register yourself. You'll have to get an E1 associate, so I'll have some information on who we can contact at the end of this presentation. I'll give you uh, access to the course. You log in. It's a 20-question test. It's 20 minutes, open book. Uh, by book, I mean any installation instructions, which you can find on e1.com. Uh, you'll click sewer systems, go to products, pick any random tank configuration, which you'll learn more about here shortly. And at the bottom of the product information, you'll see a bunch of hyperlinks on e1.com. One of them will be installation instructions. Click on that, download it, and that's your open book for your level two test. All right, so the first uh, E1 product we're going to be talking about is the D series station. Um, you guys can see from the screen, this is a 70 gallon capacity uh, up to, to uh, 500 gallons per day for max expected usage. It's an HDPE high density polyethylene tank. Um, there are multiple lid or cover configurations, um, flood and high flood, again, depending on the area that we're installing the station. And from the D-series standpoint, we, uh, we have either a one or a two pump, so simplex or duplex tank configurations. So if you can't really see it, there's a super thin line right on the shroud. I'm gonna get fancy here for you. It's gonna be right in this area. That's the grade line. So the two kind of rules of thumb, one perfect install is bury it up to the grade line. And then the ground obviously sloping away from the tank. That way rain comes down, drains away from the tank, and we don't worry about creating like a pool or a pond that floods in through the vent on the top of the station. Um, another just bare minimum uh, would be bury the black. Um, it doesn't even matter if you've got the whole green shroud sticking out of the ground. Uh, bury the black, that's kind of like the bare minimum. Uh, we would much rather it be a little high out of the ground than too low. Uh, if it's too low, that's going to cause the station to not breathe. These pumps are like people. If they don't breathe, they don't work, at least not for long. So bear the black at a minimum, ideal, get it up to the grade line. Next up is the inch and a quarter stainless steel candy cane style discharge. There's also a couple of other discharge configurations, uh, straight pipe um, that we can talk about and we can configure if, uh, if required. Generally, the straight pipes or any sort of non-standard candy cane discharge would be more for an upgrade application, so less pertinent to a new install. And then we've got our inlet four inch, and it's again configurable depending on uh, the needs of the home that this unit is being installed in or business. And then last up is the core itself, uh, and one horsepower, 1725 RPM, semi-positive displacement, progressive cavity pump. Uh, that's the core, that's the heart of this system. Without it, no fluids being moved. And all of our D-series stations are equipped with a quick latch mechanism. Uh, the core sits on a deck in the transition of the tank. So the transition is uh, just a, a piece of HDPE that you'll look down and you can kind of see it. Uh, the pump sits right in on that and latches in place. Uh, you will lock and unlock the core with a core wrench. Typically, these are supplied with the station. And again, depending on how deep the station needs to be in order to get your proper slope to two degree uh, fall, so that way fluid actually drains into the tank, uh, we can configure the core, core wrenches in uh, customizable lengths. Again, there's that big old warning sticker. Don't over tighten it, don't over crank it. Um, it's just a third of a turn. And uh, yep, make sure that uh, proper force, don't overdo it. All right. We, uh, looks like we lost some pictures here. Give me a second, guys. Uh, okay, we're going to jump into a video real fast for you. I'm going to pull up the DHO71 overview for us.
All right, so be gentle if the camera adds 10 pounds, and in my case might be a hair more than that. Um, I have not gotten these pictures up, so we're gonna, there we go, jump through a couple of them real fast. So the previous slides were talking about just the differences between the, uh, the standard most popular configurations of the E1 product style. On the left, you see the WH101 right here. So you can see in it, we've got a flexible pose as opposed to the candy cane style on the D series product line. The W series, instead of sitting in a transition, so I was mentioning earlier, the transition being a piece of HTP that the actual top housing rests on. Uh, you're gonna see stands at the bottom. Again, stands also have configurable heights, depending um, if you need it. The check valve anti-siphon assembly is also a hair different between the W series and the D series, obviously to adapt to the discharge itself, the flex hose versus the, uh, the candy cane. So the D-Series, again, just like the video kind of brought out, this is a wet well, dry well station design. So it's pretty popular in the Northeast. In the South, we generally see a lot more W-Series, the open wet wells. Uh, the D-Series, from a serviceability standpoint, even an installation standpoint, uh, a lot of people that work with the E1 product prefer the D-Series in terms of installing and pulling the pump. Um, the biggest reason is there is a, a high chance you're going to have a dry access way. So obviously, I say fluid. That's not actually what goes into these stations most of the time. So having the ability to pull a pump from a dry access way is uh, is definitely a creature comfort that most people appreciate. On the D-Series products, again, our capacities range from 70 gallons up to a 500-gallon tank. Uh, we're going to show some of those here in a little bit. Uh, one or two pump system. So the single pumps are 70 and 150 gallon capacities. Uh, generally, the 70s is all that is needed for a home. There are some exceptions to that rule. If there are local municipalities, cities, counties that have, um, I've heard it called a power loss retention capacity requirement, um, then they'll request or require that a station be able to hold a certain amount of fluid at a time. Um, in the low pressure sewer world, bigger is not better. Uh, we size stations based on the maximum expected flow per day through the system. Uh, the bigger a station is and the lower the flow that it's going to see, then we're not moving the fluid out of the tank as efficiently or as, um, as much as we would like to in a given day. When sewage begins to sit, uh, it turns septic. Uh, I've heard that eight hours is when it starts to turn and in 48, the station will be fully septic. Uh, once sewage goes septic, then now the bugs are eating the solids and releasing gases. Um, those gases are corrosive to cast iron. Um, and you can see the crenellations in the castings. Again, I'll get out the fancy highlighter here. Um, spotlight. These crenellations, and especially where the bolts are as well, the overhangs, uh, these corrosive gases will sit underneath these uh, overhangs and the crenellations. And that's when you'll begin, that's where you'll begin to see corrosion begin. Once corrosion happens, it gets behind the paint and the life expectancy drastically is reduced on a station that is going septic, that is seeing this type of corrosive attack. So the way to combat that, a few different ways. One, dilution is a solution, add more fluid. The easiest way to add more fluid is to make the tank smaller. That way, when fluid comes in, so generally there's about 14 inches that we're gonna hold at any given time. Pump turns on normally around the 18 inch mark. So we're only moving about four inches of fluid at a time per cycle which is about eight gallons. So the biggest way in this station, it's eight gallons. The biggest way to reduce um, sewage turning septic is to make sure we get proper number of cycles a day. Let's take that single family home, for example, M my house. We use between 80 and 100 gallons a day. So that's actually much less than what the, I guess, statistical average is or the, the assumption. It's two to 300 gallons a day for a, a four person home and my family is four and we're using between 80 and 100. And if we're only moving eight gallons per cycle at 100 gallons per day, that's only eight cycles. That's more than enough to keep the station from going septic. If we had a 150 gallon tank, now we're gonna be cycling probably a little less than half as much, so about four or five uh, cycles per day. And again, that just gives the sewage more time to sit, more time to turn septic. Uh, so I hope all of that makes sense. The smaller size is better for a couple of reasons, one cost. The smaller stations are more cost efficient. The smaller stations also 
sized properly to the application we're using will help maintain an adequate number of cycles per day, which will minimize the corrosion risks, the, the, the risk of the station going septic and having those bugs create gases and, and corroding the stations itself. The two pump systems, 150 gallons, 272 gallons, and 500 gallons, these are generally used more in what we'll call commercial or light commercial applications. Um, restaurants, strip malls, uh, condos, apartments, assisted living facilities, things where we have multiple homes feeding in or multiple residences, multiple businesses feeding into the same tank. Uh, again, these are not going to be considered normal residential applications, and that's not a bad thing. Um, E1's bread and butter is the residential application, uh, but even on a commercial or light commercial application with a little bit of extra TLC, uh, you can get a very long and happy life out of your stations. Um, if you guys have questions about that, just contact us, drop some questions in the chat box, and we'll be more than happy to kind of guide you guys into how to set these light commercial and commercial applications up for a, a longer and happier life. Uh, last little bullet on here is field variable tank heights. So the best way to get your station configured for a proper height is to let the let us see where it, and then we can let environment one know how deep the station needs to be. Um, there are things that can be done after the fact, after a product has been ordered to properly configure tank heights, uh, and we'll go into that near the end of the presentation. Um, but the best way is to know your, your invert depths. If we know invert, we know frost depth, and we can make sure you guys get the proper tank height for your application. Um, and again, here it's uh, general ranges from 61 inches through 200 inches, and 200 is generally considered the max height for, uh, for a standard station. All right, so these are our different potential D-series uh, product configurations. Again, all of these are based on E1's original design, and the two currently that you can actually read information on are the most commonly used overall. Uh, the DHO-71, you guys saw a little video on that. Um, 70 gallons up to 700 per day. Uh, I believe I said up to 500 earlier. That was a mistake. And then we've got the DH-151, single pump, 150 gallons, up to 1,500 gallons per day. And again, this, I would see it more commonly used in light commercial or in municipalities that have that power loss uh, retention requirement, where we need to be able to hold more in the event of a power loss. Um, there's also other things that can be done in the event of that power loss retention um, capacity requirement. Uh, Talk to us later, drop something in chat, and we can kind of give you guys some ideas on how to uh, use the smaller station, yet still maintain local uh, code requirements for the, the additional capacity that's required. Uh, again, the final three are going to be more for your light commercial and commercial, the DH-152. Um, so I'm going to park here and do a quick little uh, teach, and that is how to decode these tank configurations. So the first initial the first letter in the model type is the style of pump, so D for dry well. If these were W series stations, obviously that would start with a W. Uh, H is going to be hardwired. So Environment One offers two different styles of, uh, of core. Uh, for the most part, the two main styles are hardwired or wireless uh, radio frequency. So if this was a wireless unit, you would see R. Um, generally, we're not going to recommend the wireless product, not because it's inferior, just because of cost and lead times. Um, the, the wireless components, transceiver and transponder inside of the pumps, um, are more expensive. They're uh, lower volume purchased by Environment One. There are lower stocked quantities, so the lead times to order replacements are going to be longer, and the cost of the product is generally higher. Um, hardwired is E1's bread and butter. That's the standard configuration. They build it every day. Um, see where it has tons of them in inventory ready to go for you guys whenever you need it. So the, the more often we can stick to stock standard product, um, the better it's going to be for you guys in terms of just outright cost and lead time and availability. The next uh, digits you're going to see are the numbers, and this is going to start to talk about the capacity of the tank as well as the number of pumps in the system. So you guys kind of see 150 gallons that lines up with the first two numbers after the tank and pump um, clarifier. So 1.5 is 150 gallons, and then the final digit is the quantity of pumps inside of the tank. So 152, two pumps. And the pattern kind of repeats itself through the 
uh, models of the D-series as well as the Ws. So we stopped at the 152, two pumps, 150 gallon capacity up to 3,000 gallons a day. Again, really great for the uh, the commercial light commercial applications. And again, the larger the commercial application, then we can start upping the tank size to a 270 gallon station or a 500 gallon station. And you can see what that does to the maximum uh, gallons per day that the station can move. That obviously rises with the size of the tank. So we're gonna see if we have another video here for you that compares the, uh, the 151 and the 152. And here it is for you. All right, that guy needs to slow down on the coffee. He was talking very fast. Next slide for us is the W series stations from Environment One. So W obviously means wet well, open wet well. Um, the picture is a little small, but you can uh, see that there is no transition inside of the station. So right when you pop the lid, you can look all the way down into the basin. So I was telling you guys earlier that in the north, northeast New England state specifically, the D series is incredibly common. In the south, the open wet wells are, are much more uh, frequently purchased than the D series stations are. Um, I don't really have a great answer as to why that is. Um, possibly upgrade units, uh, other competing products have gotten a, a foothold down there and they're using the W series as just straight drop-ins. Um, the 101, the HDPE side style station or fiberglass. Uh, but again, and it's still an option that can be used here. Uh, so same nomenclature, W wet well H hardwired, 100 gallon capacity, one pump system. Again, just like the D-Series, it's incredibly versatile. Uh, we have customizable uh, tank diameters through the fiberglass side, 24 inches up to 72. Um, the W-Series, the 101 itself, um, is going to be what you see right there. Uh, station height, 60 to 240 inches tall. Um, and again, just see the little note on the side. These PE tanks have some height restrictions, and we'll kind of cover those a little bit later. Fiberglass stations are another option. I, I mentioned that down south. Uh, these, from a cost standpoint, are going to be a little less expensive for you, and, and for the most part. Um, and if I'm misspeaking, Will will jump in and yell at me real fast. Uh, but fiberglass has a really wide range of applications and customizations that the HDPE styles um, are going to be a little less um, flexible for. And the fiberglass can handle one through four pumps. So can the W series through these next uh, couple station styles, the WH471-2 or the 480 two, three, and four. Uh, again, these stations are generally seen in the light commercial, commercial applications while the 101 and the fiberglass, um, so at least the 24 inch, the, the standard configs, the standard diameters are gonna be more for your single family residentials. So the E1 again, it's the most versatile product. It can be used pretty much anywhere. Um, the W series pump can be dropped in to almost anywhere. And that's a great thing and also can create uh, some applications or, or life expectancy problems. 
remember that wherever the pump is put in, it's going to move whatever fluid's inside of there. So if you've got some random concrete vault that's experiencing infiltration, groundwater, dirt, debris, uh, the pump is going to try to move it. Um, we'll talk about ways to combat that later via E1 panel types, the Protect Plus lines. Um, but for the most part, if there's fluid in the tank up to a certain level, the pump is going to turn on and try to move it out. So in these older vaults or these tanks that are not necessarily installed properly, these pumps are going to move whatever fluid's in there. So to make sure that the pump does see a long, happy, healthy life, uh, the tank does need to be installed properly and we need to make sure we're keeping anything but what we want going in. Keep that out. Uh, choice of basin, cover, and discharge materials are all configurable um, for these styled products. Again, one through four pumps. It's an open wet well design. Uh, the tank depths range, just like the screen set, 61 inches through 160. Uh, before we moved on from there, uh, I wanted to take a quick pause and see Sherry or Will, have you guys seen any questions come through the audience? No questions yet. Great. And uh, the last kind of tank style, this is not generally, um, this doesn't fit the mold for the other two. Um, and again, really common in the New England states. I don't see, uh, when I was at E1, I didn't see any other part of the country use this indoor uh, system as heavily as we do in the New England states. Um, there's probably a couple of reasons why it's it's not as welcomed as the other two stations, and it's because this can go inside uh, of your house. So now we've got a tank holding sewage inside, uh, and that generally scares people, and it really shouldn't. Um, these tanks are incredible. Um, can Obviously, you guys can see from this small little picture, the installation is incredibly easy. That helps keep costs down to the customer. And these indoor units come with a standard five-year warranty from the manufacturer, um, as opposed to the outdoor stations that only carry two. Now, these are great for new construction. There's a 90-gallon capacity. Um, these do accommodate all of E1's standard panel types from the basic all the way up through the Protect Plus with the remote monitoring or the telemetry system attached to it. Um, Again, really, really easy to use, install, and maintain. Um, not a lot of reasons why people should be scared of these. And again, it's that small hurdle of a tank in the basement that's holding sewage inside of your home. Um, if we can figure out how to get people past that little mental hiccup, um, these are an incredibly useful product type. And again, the five-year warranties is really great peace of mind for customers. Now we'll move on from the pumps and from the tanks into uh, some of the components inside of the system. So this is not in the pump, but it's part of the system that makes the pump function. So I mentioned earlier from this burial depths, um, there's that little grade line on the, uh, the shroud, the cover shroud for the station that we're gonna try to bury the station up to. We don't wanna go above it, but if we're a little below it, that's fine as well. Pumps are like people, they need to breathe to function properly. Uh, this equalizer allows breathing to happen normally. It allows atmospheric pressure changes to be compensated for uh, in just normal weather patterns. So uh, the trick question that I would usually ask customers during E1 training is if I just went up to any random E1 station anywhere and pulled off the breather tube and took that equalizer away, would the station work? Absolutely, so long as the station is buried properly and we're vented properly. We don't need the equalizer. The equalizer does one additional thing for the system. It keeps water out of the switch compartment. So these E1 pumps, um, they operate on internally housed differential pressure switches. Uh, we don't use floats. We, right here, use pressure switches. So there is a switch compartment that's in a level sensor assembly that kind of hugs the pump from the top down vertically. Um, this equalizer keeps water out of the switches and accounts for atmospheric pressure changes. So this, you'll see it in a neutral state like this. This is fresh off the manufacturing line. We pop the inspection port and it kind of looks like the top hat. That's what generally service guys call this thing is top hat. In real normal applications where the pump is functioning, um, this will be in some slightly inflated or slightly deflated uh, position. It'll look like it's crinkled down or crinkled up. That means it's doing its job. That means a high pressure front or a low pressure front moved in from weather standpoint and the diaphragm, that top hat, has moved 
to keep that atmospheric pressure constant where we need to. We have the pressure pushing on the water is the same pressure pushing on the switches, which is the same pressure pushing on that top hat. So that keeps that reference pressure for us and it's keeping water out of the switch compartment. Again, all doing one thing, allowing the pump to turn on when there's fluid and turn off when there's not. If the station is buried too low, if this breather tube that connects the equalizer to the switches is pinched, if we lose the ability to sense atmospheric pressure, the pump is not going to operate normally. And if it is, it's not gonna operate normally for long. Um, again, how long can you hold your breath before something bad happens? The pump is gonna be in the same boat that we are. Uh, once you cut off the air supply, eventually something bad is going to happen. And back to normal reading mode. Our next feature inside of the stations is the electrical quick disconnect. Uh, the extreme version is what you're seeing right now, and this is a huge improvement on the older style 2000 series um, electrical quick disconnect. Um, not in terms of just product performance because they're both great. They do exactly what we need them to do, and that's keep sewage out of the electrical connections. The benefit of using the Extreme Series is tool-free locking up, no screws, hand tight. Uh, there's a double radial seal inside right below the uh, that locking collar that you can see here. So right when you put the two halves of the electrical quick disconnect together, the seal is created. Uh, then you just use that tool-free locking that hand tight. That way you're just keeping the two pieces of plastic from falling apart. The older version, the 2000 series, um, used two captive screws. And again, there was a gasket in the middle and those screws had to be tightened down properly. And it made installation a little bit more uh, cumbersome because now we have to verify that we tightened it down properly and we got gasket compression the way we needed to. The extreme version is just painlessly easy. Um, it makes error almost impossible. As long as you pay attention to what you're doing, you slip the two pieces of plastic together, then hand tight and we can walk away. The next slide is going to show how we need this to be hung. So this is really the only um, problem that can be created is if the EQD is not hung properly. So we want it high and dry, uh, just like that equalizer. So you can see the EQD is hung through the hooks on the cover shroud itself, top of the tank. We got the rope hung up that way in the event service is needed. Uh, we have access to the rope, we can pull the pump right out. And then the equalizer, again, right there, um, hung high and dry. The biggest problem that uh, we would get phone calls from, so at E1, I did a lot of tech support, I did warranty and support coordination, as well as uh, manage the telemetry systems. Um, we'd field calls from distributors and service providers, installers, builders, plumbers across the country. Um, plumbers would be generally the ones to get us. Um, they would say, hey, we got a call out to a station. Uh, we think we found the problem. Your float was hung up at the top of the tank. We threw it into the soup for you. Uh, don't worry, we, we didn't charge the customer for anything. We're, we're on our way. Um, there's actually a little mark on the e uh, equalizer, excuse me, that says this is not a float. I mentioned it earlier. We use internally housed differential pressure switches, similar to what you'd find in a washing machine. No floats at all on this system. So if uh, you guys see this, it needs to be hung. This is a model picture, uh, high and dry to the tank. That way we can make sure there's no fluid inside the EQD, no fluid inside of the equalizer. And again, station breathes, we keep water out of the switch compartment. And that way when a customer flushes a toilet, the fluid goes exactly where we want it to, into the force main and not either into an electrical connection or back up into their home. Next part of the E1 product overview is gonna be panels. Uh, so on the left, you can see a couple of standard simplex panels. Uh, again, different size enclosures to accommodate uh, potential features that uh, you guys could ask for. Um, you can see on the left, we got the generator receptacle right here. And every E1 panel is configurable with a generator um, receptacle. The full gen set package, it's got an auto transfer switch. Um, inside or without. Um, on the topic of gen sets in E1 panels, if a generator is going to be used in conjunction with an E1 system, the generator does have a minimum requirement. Uh, E1 recommends and borderline requires a 6,500 watt generator to reliably start 
the E1 system in the event that a generator is being used. Uh, it's also recommended that the generator does not have an auto idle feature. And if, uh, if you are gonna use the generator again, give it adequate time to warm up um, before you fire the system up with it. So no auto idle, 6,500 watt minimum, um, and give it a little bit to warm up, get it, get it uh, up to full speed. Uh, on a side note, if you happen to have like a 20, 30 year old Honda generator back in those days, um, they overdid the copper. So you might be able to get away with running an E1 system off a slightly lower wattage generator. But again, if you're buying something new generator in the last 10 years or so, you are not going to get more out of it than the nameplate information on that generator says. If a manufacturer of a Jenny says, 5,000 watt max, that's inrush current. That's not normal running wattage that it's uh, it's talking about. That's its max inrush. The panel on the right, uh, it says pre-stat on the panel. Uh, please, everybody on this call, do not buy pre-stat. Um, that's old school phone lines being like jacked into the panel box. Um, the Protect Plus panel is where we wanna go. And we'll be talking about that here in a little bit, but the, the, the pre-stat, the Protect Plus, both have a very common interface. You can see the LCD screen um, and the, the kind of diagnostic panel that we can actually use to see system performance, quantity of cycles, um, mins, maxes, and averages for runtime, voltage, amperage, wattage. And there's also a, a few different protective features baked in. And again, we'll, we'll hit on those in a bit. Uh, I just wanted to give you a little preface now. And there we go. So these are the different versions of the panel that uh, Environment One offers and that uh, Seaworth's gonna supply for you, the basic simplex only. So uh, I'm gonna be crude here. I'm gonna call this the dumb panel. Um, it doesn't know much. It knows how to turn a pump on, turn a pump off and activate an alarm in the event that the alarm switch closes. There's also a manual run button. So this doesn't matter if you're trying to run it on 200 volts, the pump's gonna try to run and likely hurt itself. Uh, if we have 280 volts, again, same thing. If there's fluid in the tank, the pump is gonna to try to turn on and probably hurt itself. So if we have conditions uh, created by an improper installation or voltage issues inside of the home or um, applications issues or the, the homeowners throwing stuff down the tank that shouldn't be there, um, as long as there's fluid in the tank, the basic panel is going to try to run the pump. That's it, um, which is going to likely lead to it hurting itself. Uh, T260 is the dumb version of a two pump system. Um, Pre-stats, we're gonna ignore. Uh, pretend that that product doesn't even exist. I actually don't think E1 has sold one of these in ages. Um, this should be stripped from the presentation. Then we're gonna get to the good stuff, the Protect and the Protect Plus. So this is where um, technology really shines, helps minimize the, the risk of failure from acts of nature, mother, uh, mother nature, acts of God, or homeowners being just regular old homeowners and throwing bad things down the station. Um, there's protective features that are gonna help minimize any damage that can be done to the product because of those things. So we'll start off with the dumb one. And uh, again, like I said, it's pretty basic inside the box. Uh, we've got our manual run switch. Let me pull up my spotlight. So manual run switch here. We've got the circuit breakers again for the pump and the alarm. So pump, double pole, alarm breaker, single pole. We've got an audible alarm buzzer right at the bottom of the box. And we've got our silent switch, which is directly in front of it. But you guys can see this little cutout here. It's kind of hard to read blurry picture underneath that. And shout out to you, Mr. Derek Lillis. We call it a little gray squishy button. Uh, you push the gray squishy button and it makes the, the panel crying stop. Um, I wish my three and a half year old twins had a little gray squishy button that I could push. Um, if you find it, let me know and I will try. Uh, the visual alarm is next right at the top of the, uh, the panel box. And then a uh, redundant run. So that's not actually like a feature that I can point out to you. Um, there is a redundant run relay, but this means, so redundant run means uh, on a simplex station specifically, that if I went to a random site and pulled the on-off switch out, crinkled it up and threw it away, and the only thing inside of that pump was an alarm switch, that the pump would still run redundantly through that alarm switch. So it's important to note, and we'll, we'll explain a little bit more of why I'm saying it the way I did now when we get to the next slide, which is or two slides from now when we talk about the duplex systems. So additional features that can be added to a basic simplex panel, and honestly, this can be added to pretty much every 
panel offering um, would be dry contacts. Um, dry contacts, so this means a, an ability to sense the position of the alarm switch. Not do anything about it necessarily, but sense it. So we use dry contacts to add in additional features like a uh, remote sentry. So that's the dumb version of telemetry. Remote sentry is just a little box. Let's say this panel was um, 400 yards away from your actual home. So you're in the home, you're in your recliner, sitting in the living room watching Pirate Jack with your little ones and your alarm goes off in your panel box outside. You can't hear it because it's 400 yards away. So the remote sentry would tie into the dry contact spot and there'd be a tiny little box that would be wired somewhere in your house, generally in a, a, a habited living space, like that living room where you're watching Pirate Jack for the hundredth time. The alarm would go off inside through that uh, remote sentry and you would know, oh, there's a problem. I should probably minimize water usage and then maybe make a phone call, figure out what I need to do next. Call Seawork, um, call your municipality if they're providing service for you, or honestly, homeowners may call you as the installer because you've built a relationship with them. The next thing we can add into these panel boxes, and we'll really only need to do it on these dumb panels because they don't have a diagnostic panel or diagnostic menu that's doing it for you, is an hour meter. Um, so hour meters are exactly what they say they are. They count hours and count cycles. Um, we were talking earlier during the, the, the tank sizing kind of overview about how many cycles a day we expect the station to, to do and how much runtime uh, we expect per cycle. So 20 to 30 cycles a day is generally what E1 would consider an average, again, with my personal family's water usage. I would say my house, we would see between 8 and 12, 8 and 15 cycles. Each cycle should last between 30 seconds and a minute. So if I've had a pump for a month, that's 30 days running, we'll just call it 10 cycles a day, each cycle being about a minute. So 10 minutes times 30 is 300 minutes. If after a month I checked my panel and I had 1,000 minutes or, or a few hundred hours of runtime, that would be a big problem. So our meters can kind of be used as a little bit of a self-check on what the panel and pump are actually doing, how much fluid you've got moving through your station. And that can tell you, is it too much? Is it not enough? Uh, and potential problems could be kind of identified just using the hour meter readouts. Uh, we talked a little bit about genset receptacle and the auto transfer relay. Again, that would be um, a feature that the, the Northeast New England states use a lot. Um, our winter weather, obviously, uh, ice storms knock power out. Having the uh, the gen sets are really nice. In the south, southeast, the hurricanes obviously are a big reason why customers uh, tend to go for the gen set and uh, the auto transfer. So the gen receptacle, again, would be on the right side of the panel box here. And the auto transfer relay, relay would generally be in the top left on this basic simplex design. Um, dead fronts are customizable with these basic uh, simplex panels. Again, the, the biggest point of a dead front is to uh, put a barrier between your hands and live electricity. Uh, it's not standard on these, so that would have to be configured additionally. Um, don't see it used very often um, in certain areas, though, uh, where there's a lot of little ones running around, or if uh, there's code, local requirements, dead fronts can be configured. Um, the, the GFCI, now I've got a bunch of little notes for myself written down. Um, I, I really don't recommend anybody to put a GFCI in any of these panels. Uh, I was, I think it was either Louisiana or Mississippi. Uh, I was down there for E1 geez, five, six years ago, and we were doing startups on like 180 something units. And uh, it's in Podunk, Marsh, Swamp Land. Um, I'm running around Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, everything's all good. And it's probably like late Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I get to this small little, um, I don't even know what to call it, this little swamp bayou area, and it's a trailer. And no front door on the trailer. There's a, uh, a sawhorse where a guy's got like a, a piece of plywood on top of this couple of sawhorses where he's working on a boat motor. This boat motor had to be seven, eight, nine thousand dollars. It was a gorgeous boat motor. And looking at the the trailer behind it, I'm like, huh, boat motor might actually be more than the trailer. But well, it's here, neither here nor there. Their uh, panel was mounted on a uh, power pole right at the front of the property. And again, no panel door on it, which struck me as a little bit odd. And I see something dangling from the panel and go over to the panel. Obviously, it's got a GFCI in it and dangling from the plug is a waffle iron. The guy literally had a waffle iron plugged into the panel box. It was because the uh, the panel was unmetered. So this was city paying for all of the E1 power consumption. 
And he realized that if he wanted waffles in the morning, he could get somebody else to pay for the electricity to do it. Um, side story on that one. Little girl was uh, coming out from behind the trailer. She was adorable. My kids are three and a half. I think she was probably five-ish, maybe. And she had this gigantic goose egg right between her eyes. And she comes up asking me what I'm doing and told her I was there to do a startup on her system. And uh, she obviously was pretending like she understood anything that I was saying. But I looked at her and said, hey, what happened? Why? How'd you get that big goose egg right on your forehead? And without even batting an eyelash, she said, those damn ducks. And I obviously had to ask her, what are you talking about? So she points over her shoulder and there are these uh, special kind of ducks down south. I'd never heard of them. I'm used to the the mallards, the, the duck head brand, right? They, they look really pretty, cool, cute, normal. Um, there are these ducks called scogies. Uh, looks like somebody threw a cup of acid in their face. It's just really ugly looking face. And apparently she was trying to play with the ducklings. And uh, the mama duck got a little angry about it, came over and just beaked her right in the forehead, laid her out. And she goes, don't worry though, my daddy taught me how to handle them. So she goes to the front door of the trailer that should have been there and wasn't, and reaches inside the door and pulls out a shotgun. She's like, oh man, this always happens. She drops the shotgun right on the ground, picks up a broom and starts chasing these damn ducks. Hilarious. Again, that, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was one of my funnier ones down south. There's a couple more that I've got for you later. And if that wasn't funny to you, add two shots of Bailey's into your coffee right now. Um, because there's more bad dad jokes coming. After the GFCI is the main service disconnect breaker, and that actually would go directly to the left of these pump breakers. Again, that's just an isolation breaker. That way, if uh, service techs need to come in and isolate, and there's there's code requirements or local requirements that we can't touch uh, main incoming 240, the disconnect breaker can be used. That way, we can unwire the L1, L2 incomings or something um, and do service work in the panel. All right, next slide is the uh, the dumb two pump panel. So this is a T260 time based alternating alarm panel. Um, note that I'm not calling these control panels. There's no PLC, there's no logic. Um, the panels don't run the pumps. The panels just route power to the pumps in the event that the pumps say I have enough fluid and I want to run. Now, the exception to that, obviously, is we can use the, the hand switches or the manual run switches, whatever uh, you guys are used to calling them, to cause the pump to run manually. Uh, but again, same basic features. I'm going to pull my handy dandy spotlight out. We've got our circuit breakers, pump one, pump two. So the configuration should always be the same. Pump one on the left, pump two on the right. Same thing with the contactors up top. I've got the same audible alarm buzzer at the bottom. Uh, we've got the visual alarm light at the top of the panel itself. The alarm silent switch, that green, or excuse me, gray squishy button um, that can silence panels but not children. And our manual run switches right at the bottom of the box. Uh, note, we get calls all the time about this. If you're um, called by a customer to come out to a station and uh, you're doing troubleshooting for them, you're trying to figure out why their alarm's going off or why their pump's not running. Um, generally, you're going to find this panel in normal mode, which is alternation. One pump is lead for 24 hours, then in 24 hours, pumps alternate. Pump two becomes the lead for 24. While it's in this normal alternation mode, only the lead pump manual run button will work. So in order to get both manual run buttons to work, there's a switch right here between these ice cube relays. It says auto or both, kick it to both mode temporarily, and now we have access to both manual run buttons. Right when you do that, you should see these little plungers, and one of these plungers in the uh, contactors will pull in, which will mean both of them are pulled in at that point. Um, generally, like you see here, looks like the uh, contactor for pump one is pulled in, so that's energized. That means power is available to pump one. Pump two, that contactor is de-energized, meaning this is in auto mode, and pump one is currently lead. So the pump two manual run button will not work. So keep that in your head. And we just kind of touched on it, lead lag or both operations. So lead lag is auto. That means again, 24 hour switch. In the event that uh, a lot of fluid is added to the station very quickly, um, once pump any pump goes into alarm, the lag pump will turn on temporarily to help the station evacuate fluid quickly. Um, 
that's again, that's the point of the two pump system. Um, there is an alarm delay, so we're gonna let, these panels will let both pumps run for about three minutes together before an alarm is created. Uh, there's shunt pins at the top that allow us to change the alarm delay configuration. The alarm delay is there um, to minimize nuisance alarms. So like I said, you're only using a two pump system like this when we expect periods of high flow. Uh, so we want both pumps to be able to run in the event that they're needed. And we're gonna throw a stock alarm delay on there to make sure that any nuisance alarms are minimized. If the alarm is still active for greater than three minutes, then you're gonna see the, uh, the light come on at the top and obviously the audible will uh, turn on as well. If you happen to be here, before the, the delay has expired, the three minute delay has expired, and you're opening up the panel door, you'll see a red light come on. Um, that just means that we've got an active alarm state, but we haven't made it to the delay yet. And the uh, pumps also have additional indication features. So on the simplex, you saw one green light. That was the, uh, the run indicator light. The T260, this two pump time-based alternator has the same thing. We've got one for each pump, and again, it's gonna be green lit when the pump is running or not lit when the pump is off. Uh, we're gonna have two yellow lights as well. These are power available lights. Now, both are gonna be on. One's gonna be bright, one's gonna be dim. The bright light means that's the lead. The dim yellow light means that's the lag pump. And then obviously our reds are the high level alarms. Another thing to note on both panels, the, the basic simplex and the T260, uh, these green lights are tattletales. Um, good ones, not the children version of a tattletale. If we know, so let's say we're gonna do a little role playing here. Let's say the, the tank is directly below this panel. We can actually put our foot on it. Uh, generally when these pumps are running and your foot is on the tank lid itself, you'll feel a gentle vibration if the pump is running. Let's say we're doing that. We feel a vibration on the, on the through the tank itself and we see the green light is on. That's great. That means it's working as we expect it. Now let's say we don't feel that vibration. We know the pump is off and we can confirm that through amperage checks on the L2 wire. Uh, the pump is off, but one or both of the green lights is on. That's a tattletale for L1 and L2 being wired backwards. And it is imperative that that gets corrected immediately. If L1 and L2, so the red wire, L1, this black wire, this is where L2 lands. And I'm gonna give you guys a quick little cheat. If you need to know color codes and identifications, inside the panel door, somewhere over here, you're gonna see, yeah, my kids can draw way better than I can. Uh, you're gonna see the wiring schematic, the decal, and there's gonna be a table that says uh, red L1, black L2, brown manual run, etc. And it'll also color code it based on the version, the 2000 series versus the extreme. There was some coloring changes that were made. Um, so once you see that, we can find the pump connection at the bottom where that six conductor cable comes in and then trace those wires up to where they land. This in a T260 is where L1 and L2 should land on each pump. If these wires are backwards, it'll create opposite indications for the green run indicator lights, meaning the green lights will show you that the pump is on when it's actually off and that the pump is off when it's actually on. That in and of itself is not bad. That's a great thing because it's a tattletale. It tells us that there's a wiring issue. If we don't catch it and the pump is either ran manually through our fancy buttons down here, or if the alarm circuit activates, then that's going to create a direct short on the circuit board and potentially burn a trace. Usually it's down here. If the pump is ran manually or if the alarm is energized while these two wires are backwards, and holy cow, there's a lot of scribbles on this screen. Um, please jump in if I didn't explain this well enough uh, or if you want more clarification. Um, big thing is get the wiring right. If the wiring is wrong and a trace on this circuit board shorts out, the board is scrap. It cannot be repaired. And I think the sticker price on these boards is three, $400. So that would be a very expensive mistake for a wiring issue that can be corrected in, in a couple of minutes. All right, getting rid of all that chicken scratch for you. Um, last up again, dry contacts, same deal. Um, dry contacts come standard on a T260. Um, now they're standard dry, so we also have a thing called switch over dry contacts. 
which if you want more information on it, I can give you later. That pretty much just means that even if you lose power to the panel, we can still sense the position of the alarm switch um, as opposed to a standard dry contact, which means you need power to the board to detect the position of the alarm switch. And what we're using this for, again, is just to create a remote indication of what the position of that switch is. We could tie it into either a sentry advisor unit or a remote sentry. And again, letting the customer know no matter where the panel is physically located, that that panel and his station is in a high, or her station is in a high level alarm. And again, same uh, additional features on what can be added to this style panel. The GFCIs, uh, please don't do that. And Skokie ducks are bad. Um, we, we don't like them. Uh, hour meters, very common on these uh, T260 panels. Generally, I see a lot of T260s used in commercial applications, but in truth, um, with E1's advent of the Protect Lines, the Protect Plus, the Duplex Protect Plus, um, people are really not going for the standard T260 anymore. There's just so much more um, creature comforts and uh, an advanced protection that the Protect Plus lines provide that from a cost standpoint and a liability standpoint, um, the Protect Plus panel just saves money and saves uh, saves pump life um, in the grand scheme. So spend a couple dollars more upfront and it is going to pay off in spades at your eight, 10, 15, 20 year mark. Uh, hour meters, the gen receptacles and auto transfers, again, dead fronts as well, not standard, but configurable. And the main service disconnect is uh, always an option for you. Now we uh, are gonna move into actual station inspection. So pre-installation checks. And uh, I think this might be a good time uh, to either do one more video or let you guys uh, possibly take a quick little break. Um, I missed two videos for you. So I'm actually gonna let you take a quick break and I'm gonna throw up a couple of videos on in the background. Um, this should give us about five to eight minutes that you guys can either watch the video or, or go grab coffee and more Baileys to, to handle my presentation abilities. So first one is gonna be the E1 alarm panel introduction. Enjoy.
All right. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed those two videos. Uh, and I don't know if anybody has actually taken a quick break or needs a couple more minutes. Um, but I will yeah, go ahead and. Do you uh, have a question? Yeah. Shoot. The question is Does this cause a direct short or does it cause the pump to draw full current through the panel? Motor load hits the circuit board on a trace rated for no more than two amps. So that could be anywhere from six to 16 amps or more hitting the traces on the board. Um, so to answer the question, yes, um, full motor load hits traces on the circuit board that are only rated for two. Great, thank you, Jim. Yep. And uh, I wish I had the video for the duplex protect plus up here, Sherry, that is totally my fault, not yours. Um, I'm telling you guys, don't buy the T260s because the Duplex Protect Plus is better. And then I show you a video on T260. Um, but the same things apply. Um, just like I said in that video, uh, mind your duct seal. Use duct seal only. Um, we'll touch more on that later. So I'll give you guys another couple minutes before we start moving through the next section, the installation inspection and the pre-installation checks. So enjoy a couple more minutes and uh, I will be right back. All right. How are we looking? Any more questions, Will? Not right now. All right. Well, if you guys are all back, then we'll go ahead and get started. And if not, um, we'll catch you up in a little bit. So the next section of this installation presentation is, like I mentioned, is the pre-inspections prior to beginning your installation. Um, big things, what to look for, who's liability, and then proper storage. So what to look for is cracks, broken discharge connections, seam separation, uh, weld issues, big physical problems. If you find this at all, stop. Um, there's no point in putting a broken tank in the ground because it's not going to keep the fluid in or the dirt out. Um, again, check panel containers and pump containers for external damage. Generally a pretty good indicator. If you see a fork mark on a box or a fork mark on a tank, it's probably good to stop and look. Uh, liability, do all of these inspections prior to you signing for the receipt of your delivery. Uh, if Again, if you sign for it, it is going to be a lot harder to file a claim with the shipping company, the freight company. So inspect it first, then sign once you're happy. Uh, last up from a storage standpoint, um, cores are shipped, stacked on pallets and boxes, um, and they should be stored in dry areas. So climate control, not vitally important. Uh, E1, one of the last things that I was a, a part of prior to me uh, joining the Seaworth team was we had a customer down in, uh, I think it was Bolton Lake, North Carolina. They had pumps sitting in a Connex box, so a, a freight container um, in the laydown yard behind a uh, treatment facility for eight years. Not in boxes, just pumps sitting on the inlet shroud, excuse me, on the uh, inlet shrouds. And they were curious, hey, can these pumps be used? Are they any good? So our uh, engineering team, wet lab, Chris Grodo, 
had us bring four pumps back from a uh, handy sanitary sewer district. And uh, all four pumps were inspected visually, tested in E1 test stations. Um, they ran right off the rip. Um, no issues whatsoever, great amp draw, uh, no seizing up. Now, that surprised me a little bit because the only thing um, inside of that, the, the stator itself is a little bit of Dow 111 uh, silicone grease that helps keep that rubber slightly lubricated so that way when this, the rotor stainless steel turns inside of it, um, there's no grab, there's no uh, giant kind of friction created. Um, after eight years, I'm positive all of that 111 was gone, yet uh, these pumps fired up right away. We tore them apart, put them back together, found zero issues whatsoever. Um, no dry rot on any of the O-rings. Um, stator looked great, performed properly. So as long as they're dry, they're good. I, do, I don't really think that anyone's concerned about thermal cycling of the uh, pumps. Obviously, we're not getting these things to like minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit down in North Carolina. But at the same time, um, keeping them dry was the, the absolute most important part. Now we're going to move to keys to the proper install, to a proper install. Don't drop, roll, or lay stations on their side. So D-series units uh, are generally shipped with the pump inside of the tank already. So if you lay them on their side and roll them anywhere or if they fall over, you're putting a lot of stress on that transition piece and you can crack either the transition or the top housing itself. Um, even if there's no pumps inside of the station, take care rolling them around. Um, they're not made of glass, but at the same time, that's not their intended purpose. Uh, we're gonna place the tank itself on a six inch level bed of rounded aggregate. An inch and a quarter, or excuse me, quarter inch to three quarters inch uh, aggregate stone is generally the recommendation. Uh, we are gonna level the unit. It needs to be flat. Uh, and again, uh, the internals of the pump, the two switches, the on off switch and the alarm switch. Um, if the tank is not level, then depending on what the pump orientation is, that can change when the pumps turn on. This could change drastically to the point where the alarm and on-off switch almost activate simultaneously if the, if the level is that uh, out of whack. And again, fill the, uh, fill the tank with water to about the bottom of the inlet. That way we don't have any sort of like a float or a bounce. Um, Use ballast, the proper amount, precast, pour in place. There's only a couple E1 tank styles that don't require ballast, and that's the DH272 and 502. And that's because the design of the tank is already uh, able to kind of handle that buoyant force. So the, the 272s and the 502s don't require ballast, um, but every other tank style does. And again, check your, uh, your water table before you install. And that way we can plan properly the amount of ballast that we need. And again, multiple different styles of ballasting, and we're going to cover those in a few slides. Uh, proper backfill and compaction are mandatory. Um, this one little blurb, uh, if I feel like it should be bolded, underlined, marked in red, and have its own slide, maybe 15 slides. Um, backfill is huge. So many installations across the country that I've seen use native soil. And native soil in and of itself is not the worst thing in the world. If this native soil is sands, silts, fines, or worse, organics, that is going to create problems long-term for the station. Uh, you might not notice them immediately. It might take six months, a year, or longer before uh, settling, shifting, uh, frost heave happen. But again, that all is gonna tie back to the style of backfill that is used. Uh, if we want to set the station up for a long, happy life, use class one or class two. That's backfill material. That's what we want. Compaction is necessary in one foot lifts. Uh, if you take nothing else out of this, use your duct seal and use the proper backfill and compaction techniques, then that's huge. That's a huge win for all of us. And again, basin must be properly vented. The pumps are people. We need to breathe. And we hit this earlier when we were talking about the uh, the differences in models. The finished grade line, two to three inches below the vent area, so that little thin line right around the actual uh, cover shroud. And again, maximum up to that line, even a, a little bit lower below it is fine as well. Bury the black is the bare minimum. Um, get to the to the line itself, and again, slope the soil away from the station. Now, generally during an installation. Um, be cognizant of additional landscaping that's gonna happen. So really, you might wanna keep the soil below that grade line in case any final landscaping touches are gonna be placed and there's gonna be additional soil added past 
um, what is put there by the installers. Now, this is a uh, something that E1 has been working on for years. Um, there's a few different flavors of it. Um, this is just the most basic version. This is a quick installation reference. These are handouts available uh, to you through Seaward. Um, E1 also will uh, will provide these as well if, if you're in direct contact with them or anything. Um, it's not an eye exam, but the uh, the words are tiny and it's it's not intended for you guys to read through here. But it pretty much just talks about uh, some of the things that we have already touched on and more things we're about to talk about. Um, inspection, so I'm going to pull a little highlighter out. Inspection first, burial depths, ballasting, um, inlet and discharge configurations and, and requirements, um, backfill, and you can see all these bolds and highlights, no clay, roots, rocks, um, use class one, class two, angular crushed stone, backfills compacted, bet your lines. So a bunch of really easy, quick references for you guys. That way, you know, if you follow this, your install is going to be pretty darn good right off the rip. Uh, next to um, bullets on the second page, the electrical connection, some guidance uh, in terms of uh, what we want to see in terms of a panel install, as well as the mounting and uh, penetrations and ceiling. Now this is part two of the installation station checklist. So this, uh, I believe Seaworth gives something out like this. It's a pre-startup checklist or an install checklist, and depending on uh, what you're doing, what you're trying to earn with this installation. So I'm going to say every single installation should have one of these install checklists completely filled out. And if you get nothing else out of it, then peace of mind, that the work you performed, your your personal workmanship is of the highest quality you can deliver, that's a win. Part two to this is this is kind of the, the pre-work for E1's certified installation program. So I mentioned to you guys the difference earlier between the outdoor stations and the indoor stations. Indoors come with a stock free five-year warranty. That E1 says it's really easy to install the indoors. There's not a lot of mistakes that can be made. And we're so confident in that, that E1 put a five-year warranty on the indoors. Well, you can earn a free five-year warranty on any station. And there's a few different requirements to it. Um, that three hooks, we'll call it. One of them is a certified installation. So having this installation checklist helps begin the process to certifying your installation. Will also touched on it earlier in the uh, in the introduction, the housekeeping slides that to be eligible for certified install, we we really want you to be a certified installer. And again, so we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. Twenty minute, twenty question test. All right. So next slide. Um, this goes back to so we we parked it for a second just to talk about the the, the reference documents and the the install checklist. Uh, bed the hole. So use a minimum of six inches of quarter inch to three quarter inch rounded aggregate. You can see it here. It's great. That's not great that it's clay. I mean, you don't get walls cut like that unless you're in clay. So not awesome there. However, it's good enough because we can put the station in that we can actually use proper backfill material to fill around the station. So hopefully they're not using native soil as their backfill material. Next thing we'll talk about is the ballasting option. So um, generally, this was always E1's recommendation, was precast forms. Now, you use a ring, you drop your station in, you pour your predetermined amount of concrete in, you mold in your anchor points, so that way when we lift it, we're going to lift it properly. Once you ballast like this, you can't strap it from the top anymore. You've got to go for the lifting hooks. Um, otherwise, you're going to separate the station. Another amazing option that takes the guesswork out is using this... Uh, technology called ballast. Um, these come in four pieces with hinge pins that connect the individual pieces together. So you can see where things are hinged at. And it's tough to see in the drawings, but there are also thread points for our lifting hooks. So that way we can guarantee through this ballast technology that we've got the proper amount of backfill material. We've got easy to assemble, um, four piece design with the lifting hooks kind of pre-threaded in for us uh, really takes the guesswork and it makes repeatability incredibly easy so this is standardization uniform uniformity and really repeatable it uh, i've seen it used a lot again in the northeast this is where the technology was born um, shout out to fr mahoney this is uh, henry albro uh, design he is uh, 
an engineer up in the New England states, and, and this is a really great product that's helped a lot of installations be successful. Um, all right, and the next slide is a pour in place. So this is my least favorite way because there is about uh, 100 flavors. So we've got 25 attendees on this uh, webinar, and if I asked each of the 25 people individually, explain what pour in place means to you, I might get 20 different answers. Um, the, the answers are gonna range from dropping dry bags into the bottom of the hole uh, with a little slit in them, and then groundwater will come in and do the curing to mixing it in a bucket truck to um, proper mixing techniques, a uh, hundred different flavors of how pour and place can be done. Um, I don't recommend it because it's it's not very repeatable. The consistency is, is all across the map. Um, and you can see we're gonna probably use more concrete uh, to do this properly because it's gonna spread, it's gonna flow through um, the base of the station. So you're gonna, you're gonna need a little more to get the same result and the consistency, the repeatability is low. Don't recommend this one. So now depending on which style ballasting you chose, there's obviously gonna be two different lifting techniques. If you're gonna do a pour in place, then you're gonna look at the one on the right and that's the, uh, the, strapping, mechanism, or the strapping method to lower the stations down to the tank. Uh, but if you're going to take the, the proper route and do either precast or ballast, then we're going to use uh, the, the four rebar hook space 90 degrees and, and lift it properly with the spreader bar at the top. And again, we talked earlier, ensure that the station is level, uh, but just remember that a level station, you still need to work safely. So this guy's uh, not doing an awesome job. He's trying to get the job done correctly. He's just not really worried about his own health. Um, safety is huge. Seaward is incredibly serious about helping you guys work safely. And when you call us for assistance, safety is in the forefront of our mind. We're gonna be asking you about a clean, safe, accessible work area to carry yourselves to, uh, especially with the craziness going on in the world with COVID now. Um, let's not add any additional areas where our own uh, personal safety might be compromised. So like I said, I don't have a silence button for my kids, but that doesn't mean I don't want to come home to them every night. So same should go for you guys. Take care of yourselves. Level the station. Once we get the station in and leveled, obviously we've got the ballast already done. Now we're going to backfill using the proper recommended class one or class two um, stone up to the discharge and the inlet piping. So you can see here, little highlighters coming out all the way up to the inlet and looks like that's discharge connection so we're going to get that stone up as high as we can yes it's going to cost you a couple more bucks up front but the station will not move once you bed it properly and compact it and that's what we want we don't want to worry about frost heave down the road we don't want to worry about the station moving shifting settling um, this is a proper install now from an inlet uh, configuration. Um, E1 is going to allow a bunch of different options to be um, kind of customized and also uh, will can provide any additional information in terms of like local specs, city specs that are going to acquire any sort of mods on the discharge or the inlet. Um, but standard is going to be a four inch schedule 40 pipe. But again, it's a, I don't know, think of it like drainway valve. It's no pressure. We're not seeing any pressure on the inlet side. It's just a two degree pitch and then you got your fall from the home all the way to the tank. Um, there's options for four inch or six inch, SDR 35 or six inch get 40. Um, grommets are available for whatever inlet configuration is needed. Um, big notes, so past what you're gonna use for your inlet and grommet configurations, the pipe end needs to be chamfered, not should, needs to be, and then lubricated with soap. You're gonna mark the pipe three and a half inches on the OD um, and do not over insert the inlet into the tank. It's really problematic on the D series design. So on a D series, the inlet comes in below the top housing. So the top housing would be somewhere up here. So if you push this inlet too far in on a D series, the inlet can actually butt up against the core, the pump itself. Now, if there's solids coming down the inlet line, they're going to hit the end of the pipe, which is resting on the pump, and you're not falling into the tank. So now the inlet line begins to back up. The homeowner can't flush a toilet. They make a phone call. Hey, my pump is crap. It's not working. Well, not really. The problem isn't the pump. 
because the pump wants to run, it's just not seeing any, any fluid or any material. Uh, so that's going to create a call. And just think about the, the service requirement for fixing an inlet line. It's not like we're just going to go to the house a half an hour drive, um, an hour on site to fix a pump problem. This is excavation, this is dirt work, potentially either digging by hand, which could be an hours long event, or even mobilizing equipment, bringing equipment out there to dig it up. You're also disturbing the homeowner's um, yard, your landscaping. It becomes a very expensive and messy proposition to fix um, an over inserted inlet pipe or an inlet pipe that doesn't have the proper two degree pitch or an inlet pipe that is settled because we didn't bed it properly. Um, if that inlet line starts to sag in the center because we didn't bed it, now we don't we lose that two degree pitch that that fall after this the little the, the sagging point. And again, it's going to create the same thing. It's going to create a low point where solid settle, no fluid moves through, no fluid makes it to the tank, and it becomes an incredibly expensive operation to fix. Uh, pipe should enter the station straight. So these grommets are great. They do handle uh, some amount of an angle. Again, the straighter, the better. Um, when we drop the tank, uh, we should stub the inlet out if we're not tying it into the home right away. We want a minimum of five feet. And again, with a glued cap, um, I'm gonna pick on Tennessee here a little bit. Um, their, their standard inlet cap for a while was Walmart bags and duct tape. Um, those work till they don't and they all fail eventually. Um, but we want five feet away from the tank. That way, when we actually come back to do the final tie-in from the tank to the home, we're, we're digging five feet away from the tank. So we're not disturbing any of that backfill, any of the, uh, the, the, the class one, class two, any of the things that we already put in to stabilize the station itself. So five feet away, now we're not disturbing any soil around the tank and we're not gonna see any tank shifting or movement because we've now dropped a bunch of material uh, right next to the tank and it's gonna be pushed over by soil load. And again, we've uh, beat this horse pretty dead. The line should be bedded with crushed angular stone to minimize pipe deformation, to minimize sagging and creating uh, low spots where solids are going to settle. Um, ideally, we want the entire pipe bedded the whole way around. Uh, to a minimum, we want the bottom half done. Now, this is a nice little cut of what it looks like from tank discharge all the way through to the actual uh, the city force main, the central sewer. Um, and here, I was gonna bring up a little bit of a talking point. So I, I mentioned earlier that E1 supplies a ton of product. They're gonna supply this uh, curb stop and the box, but they're not gonna supply anything else. The glove is tank, pump, panel, curb stop. Um, Seaward equipment, uh, we can fill in the rest for you. Uh, our, our preference is that you guys use uh, like a DR11 HTPE. Um, we can actually supply everything and we have supplied everything all the way up through uh, the corp valve and the saddle tab. Um, so keep us in mind. If you guys are looking for a one-stop shop, uh, we are here for you. And again, we supply all of the custom fittings, the bronze fittings and the, the, the flex whips, uh, stainless steel that certain local codes require. Um, so if you would rather source it all in one place, uh, we've got what you need. So before we jumped off that slide, so the use of an inch and a quarter PVC Schedule 40 and polyethylene pipe SCR11 are recommended. So obviously there's a ton of different types of discharge piping that can be used. Um, the most important part again is bedding. You have to bed it. We do not wanna see any sags, bends or breaks because that's going to create issues with the pump getting fluid out. If there's a kink or a bend in this discharge line, a severe bend, that can actually increase pressure uh, for the when the pump is actually discharging fluid from the tank. If there's a kink in the line, now pressure, we would expect to see 20 PSI, maybe 30 PSI in the force main, and the pump is gonna be feeling two, three times that much. That's gonna overtax the pump and, and take life away from it. Um, worst case scenario, you can shear discharge lines. Um, another little side story, I think it was Arkansas, uh, two different in installation contracting groups <laughs> happened to be one on one side of the street, one on the other. Um, we were getting phone calls all, all winter um, saying, hey, pump's failing, pump's failing. Uh, it keeps blowing blue grommets and blowing capacitors. We don't know what's happening. So uh, one of my coworkers, ex-coworkers, Russ Leach went down there and uh, he's standing at the end of the street and he doesn't even need to touch a single panel or a single tank 
to know exactly what happened. The left side of the street is perfect. Everything was fine. And it's wintertime in Arkansas, so it's warm, but not warm enough. The grass does turn brown, and it's just pure brown grass. Everything is dormant, waiting for the, uh, the spring warmth to come in and uh, tell the grass to start growing again. The right side of the street, um, there was nice green strips all the way from the tank all the way to the forest main, uh, to the, where they met the forest main, the lateral lines. And Russ looked at it and goes, you guys sheared discharge lines on the right side of the street damn near every house. And the discharge line sheared, sewage was being pumped up into the grass and that sewage was great fertilizer. And uh, they had nice little green strips of grass the entire way down the street. And again, that's because they didn't take the time to bed lines. And they also didn't use the proper backfill material. So there was a ton of stress. Generally, it's put right in this area. And the lines would shear, sewage would go up, and eventually the sewage was just fertilizing this nice little green stretch of grass that was growing on the right side of the street. So again, very expensive operation to fix and intrusive to the homeowner's daily life. Um, that definitely requires equipment mobilizations. The homeowners are, their, their systems are down. They're not using any of their facilities. So uh, avoid the hassle, avoid the liability, the risk to, to, to your guys, because that would, they would be the ones coming in to correct this issue. Uh, and that's costly. So sell the product once, don't have to go back and do anything else to it. And to get to that point, bed your lines. And next up, so it's uh, this slide says highly recommended. Well, E1 backtracked on that. It is required, required that a curb stop redundant check valve be installed between the pump discharge and the street main. Doesn't really matter where. So street main, corp stop, I don't care where you put it, anywhere in this discharge line, anywhere in here. We need one. Um, E1 offers a stainless steel version of the curb stop. And again, Seawork can provide uh, bronze fittings if they're required by local codes. Um, this curb stop, there's only one thing that I've seen in eight years that was uh, able to cause these curb stops to fail, and that's ice. And why would we have ice inside of a discharge line? It's probably because it was either buried too shallow for the appropriate frost depth or in this instance that I'm referring to in Kentucky, uh, they were doing line testing fresh after an install and a nasty ice storm came in and they just left the, uh, the curb box completely wide open. So they didn't bother putting any soil back into it to kind of keep the temperature um, at least a, a hair above freezing. So they came back out and obviously the curb stops had frozen and ice doesn't care what material it's inside of. Uh, it's going to beat stainless steel every day. So really, besides uh, freak ice like that, nothing's, nothing's taking these guys out. Um, and from a cost standpoint, they're, they're very cost effective for the job that they're performing for us. E1 requires it. Most local codes are going to require a redundant check valve as well. Um, so be smart. Pick something that's going to last forever. Don't go the, uh, the Fernco route or the plastic um, fitting route. It's just not a good, not a good go. And again, if you are going to go with something alternative to a stainless steel, um, avoid the spring checks. Those aren't really great in uh, sewage applications. Uh, flapper checks are the way to go. All right, so the next slides are gonna be our electrical installs. Here we go. So E1 product comes with a, we're gonna call it tray cable. So the tray cable is what connects the pump to the panel itself. So this is tray cable all the way up to there. Below the quick disconnect, this is what's called the, um, the, the core cable, the, the pump cable itself. So the tray cable is configurable in a bunch of different lengths. Standard is 32 feet. And the reason for that is panels can be mounted wherever we need them to be, wherever you and the homeowner need them to be. Uh, which means we can generally pole mount them, post mount them, and keep them within 32 feet. Um, it's incredibly important not to splice. Uh, E1 offers a splice kit, and I don't think if I was selling you anything from Seaward, I would never sell anybody a splice kit. That just adds a lot of liability for no reason. Use the appropriate length cable. Um, this slide shows that uh, configurable lengths are available, 32 feet, uh, up to 50, 75, 100. We will go past that. Um, there is a certain point past 150 that is going to require E1 engineering evaluation because there's things that have to happen. Um, not going to go 
crazy into electrical here, uh, but uh, Ohm's law becomes a problem. Uh, voltage drop and uh, induced current, anything past 150. So 200, we're gonna start throwing resistor kits on there. And um, then even farther past 200, you're actually gonna lose one of your conductors. You're gonna lose manual run. Um, so keep that in mind. And more importantly, um, 32 feet of copper is a reasonable price. And copper is not cheap. So the longer the length cable you go, the more money you're spending in copper. So it is suitable for direct bearing. Um, all E1 supply cables, uh, tray cables that uh, are sold are suitable for direct bearing. I know a lot of codes require full conduit, which is great. Um, if you're not using full conduit, uh, we do want settling loops. You can see them down here, six to 12 inch settling loops at every vertical drop. And again, we do those for exactly what uh, the name is to account for settling. Um, depending on uh, how bad the settling is, we've seen terminal blocks ripped right off the circuit board. Uh, we've seen contactors pulled off the DIN rails. And I mean, honestly, it doesn't sound crazy, right? Well, there's a couple of uh, terminals for your alarm switch. Yellow and blue wire get plugged into it. And if those happen to be the terminals that get ripped off the circuit board, homeowner's pump fails, there's no alarm now. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna keep using water. They're gonna keep using their facilities until something really bad happens. Hopefully, it's they flood their yard. Uh, worst case, they could flood their home. So a little tiny six to 12 inch settling loop could end in like a multi-million dollar lawsuit if we flood out a homeowner's house because of um, an installation issue. That would be awful. So we got on here the, uh, the main source power coming in, 240 volts, single phase, 60 hertz. Uh, four wire, it's incredibly important that we see all four wires. Um, hot, hot, neutral ground. So L1, L2, neutral and ground. Um, then we, that main feed coming in needs to go into a dedicated 30 amp double pole breaker. We need this dedicated breaker. Uh, we want that so that way in the event there's an electrical issue with E1's system that we're not tripping any other home uh, electrical circuit. Then again, 240 volt, um, single phase, 60 hertz, four wire, number 10 minimum, again, subject to NEC and local codes coming from the main, the, the main disconnect into the E1 alarm panel. Uh, conduit must be installed for vertical rises to access to the access cover and to the alarm panel. Um, Minimum of two feet of coverage is required, so has to go, what, at least two feet, 24 inches down. Um, and we talked about the settling loops already. Those are incredibly easy to put in and they perform such an important purpose uh, for the electrical installation that uh, they need to be there. And again, 30 amp dedicated services is required. Um, don't cheap out, don't go for like the 20 amp lighting breakers. Um, a couple of big reasons for this, right, is the, the breakers inside of the panel box. If we want to see that 30 amp dedicated, because if there is an electrical fault in the pump, generally it's going to trip the pump breakers. So the pump breakers, we need those inside the E1 panel, not the dedicated 30 to trip first. We want, oh, hold on. We want the pump breakers in here to trip first, not the main disconnect. Because if the pump breakers trip, great, I don't really care. Pump's not gonna run, but guess what will still turn on? The alarm in the event that fluid rises to a, a point where the alarm activates. If we trip the 30 amp disconnect because we used something smaller, now we've just killed both the alarm and the pump breaker. So again, if this gets tripped, homeowner's not gonna know that their system is not working because they're not gonna hear an alarm. So use the proper 30 amp dedicated breaker to feed the E1 alarm panel. And again, for 240 volt systems, it's four wire, L1, L2, neutral and ground. For 120 volt systems, three wires, a single hot leg, a neutral for the return path and ground. Um, I'm, I'm also gonna try to steer you guys away from the 120 volt routes. Again, it's a, a product that is not uh, as easily available as the 240 volts, not standard. Uh, lead times are longer, cost is a little higher. Um, performance wise, they're fine. Um, the E1 has made a career 50 plus years doing one thing, making one pump. Um, so product performance were consistent across the board, but just lead times and availability plus purchase price for you guys, the 240 volt is, uh, is the more efficient option. So keep that in your heads.
And now uh, again, back to the electrical. Um, we talked about the configurable tray cable lengths. So 32 feet all the way up to whatever you need to get the job done. Um, if let's say we only needed 10 feet, we've got a 32 foot cable. We're going to pull all of that excess cable through this cord grip. And we're only gonna leave between, I wanna call it three and five feet of cable inside of the tank itself. And we're not going to coil it up. So we're gonna pull it so that the stop is gonna leave you about three. Um, having been out into the real world and then pulling pumps and servicing pumps, um, I'd like to see five feet that way. I don't have to be like hunched over if I'm doing electrical checks inside of the, uh, the tank itself. Um, but three or five feet, just let it dangle. All the excess gets pulled through the cable back up into the panel and then cut. Um, we do not want to coil it anywhere. Again, we talked earlier about uh, Ohm's law and induced current. Uh, coiled copper is the, the beginnings, the basics of an electric motor. You put voltage through coiled copper and you're going to create current. You're going to create uh, the ability to run the pump. And that doesn't require enough fluid in the tank to be present. If there's current, then the pump can run and it can run dry. That can burn up mechanical seals. That can um, flood motors and potentially uh, controls failures and stator failures. So it become very expensive and it's really tough uh, to spot that if you're not looking. So pull all the excess out, cut it. Make sure you install your shroud. Um, again, this is just a safety standpoint. We don't want uh, any uh, possibility of weed whackers or something coming in, clipping the, the cable and um, electrocuting a customer, uh, a child, somebody doing yard work. Uh, and a side note, tighten the liquid tight cord grip, um, double wrench, one inside, one out. So there's, I'm going to call it a sick of seal, sick of tape, sick of bead uh, that is used to seal this, this cord grip connection, um, put inside and out. So one wrench on the inside, one wrench on the out. We don't want to break that like sick of seal that uh, E1 has created. And if you're only using a wrench on, on the outside, there's a chance you're going to break that sick of seal. And that's going to be, again, a path for groundwater infiltration into your station. Uh, so double wrench method is, uh, is always beneficial there. And then panel heights. So uh, all stations are, again, like the uh, one of the videos I showed you guys earlier, um, all stations are provided with a NEMA rated 4X alarm panel. So NEMA rating uh, 4X specifically is a certain style of splash resistance. So I think the test is like a garden hose, certain number of gallons per minute um, at a certain distance away, and the panel has to stay dry um, for the duration of the test. Um, Minimum mounting height, we're going to say it's between 36 inches and, and 60. Um, again, just think about serviceability standpoints and where the panel is physically located. In the north, snow. So snow can build up pretty high. We want the panel to be above uh, what we expect snow coverage to be. And in the south, obviously flooding. Um, so we want the panel to be above flood zones, but we don't want the panel to be seven feet because most of us are going to have a little bit of an issue reaching it to, uh, to silence it, to do inspections, troubleshooting, voltage, continuity, et cetera. Um, it is also recommended, now this will not void warranty, but again, it's, it's a safety thing for both um, the, the service personnel on site and potentially installers if you guys are going to be doing any eventual service work on stations. The alarm panels and stations should be mounted within direct line of sight. That way, if you happen to be inside the tank at the electrical quick disconnect and you, had, you shut the alarm breakers off or the pump breakers off, that you can see if somebody's over there flipping breakers and you know, get your hands out of the electrical equipment. All right, inside of it. So we kind of touched on this a bit earlier um, with the feature overview of each of the different panel types. Um, we see here, we're going to be talking more about the... Uh, the installation aspect of it. So we've got um, color-coded wires, red L1, black L2. Um, I wish I could say that about 176 more times um, because this is not a 120 is 120 and everybody is treated equally. Um, E1 intentionally breaks the legs inside of the pump. So it is vital that L1 and L2 have their own home and they have their own colors. Just like the question we got asked earlier, we don't want to create uh, direct shorts or, or transfer full motor load on the circuit board. You can kind of see in this little white silk screen, all uh, connections not to exceed two amps. We put motor load through the circuit board, motor load again, normal running amperage is between five and a half and we'll call it seven and a half amps. So even just regular, not even startup current, but normal running current 
is going to be enough to, to take the traces out on that circuit board and turn it into a very expensive piece of scrap. So red L1, black L2, again, pump leads. We got our neutral wire. That's coming from the main source. Brown, manual run, yellow alarm feed, and blue alarm return. Those two are incredibly important. Again, if the pump fails, this alerts the homeowner that there is a problem with their station and they need to minimize water usage and call for service. The four wire source, we've got our incoming L1 and L2, the ground and our neutral. Now, uh, when I hosted these presentations for E1 every, uh, geez, every month, um, this is a trick question and I'm gonna see if we can garner some audience feedback. I'm gonna tell you up front, there's two right answers here. One's more right than the other. Uh, what of the main four wires coming in, the L1, L2, neutral, and ground, what is the most important of those four wires? I'll give a few seconds for somebody to type in chat and I'll have I'll have the answers read out to us. And if you guys were with me, I would say I'd buy you a beer tonight, but uh, I have to keep six feet away from you, right? How are we looking, Will? Any answers in there yet? We have ground. That was one of the appropriate answers. That's not the one I was looking for. That's why I said it's kind of a trick. It's kind of not. So ground is people protection. If it's not ground that I care about as much, what would the other wire be? Derek Lewis, don't you disappoint me. You better answer. Anybody good at whistling the Jeopardy theme song? Do, do, do. <laughs> All right, what do we got? I think I hear another chat thing coming, right? Nope, nothing yet. Nothing yet? All right. Um, so we'll pretend this is a, who wants to be a millionaire, phone a friend, pull the audience, or 50 50. Paul, put one in. Okay. Oh, we have neutral. Yep. Neutral, one, there. One. That is neutral for anything. Neutral is what gets voltage out of the circuit board. And we can't get voltage in if we don't have a return path to get voltage out. So neutral allows the alarm functionality. If there was no neutral plugged in to this or any E1 alarm panel on a standard 240 volt four wire configuration, we would have no alarm functionality, no manual run functionality. The pump would still run on the on off switch, but if it failed, you would never know. Now, E1 did come out with a uh, no neutral required panel. Uh, and Seaward does offer these, so we have them. If, uh, if there's an area where it's just not economically practical to have the end user, the customer, pull that neutral wire from their main drop, we can accommodate. But if this is supposed to be a 240 volt four wire system, that neutral wire allows the alarm functionality. Yes, ground is vital. Ground is people protection all day, every day. Um, and we want to keep people out of this. But I mean, E1 has done really good with these $1.50 uh, cheap little locks that, that stop everybody from going in. Um, that's why the ground is fine. We're good there. But the neutral wire allows customers to know my pump isn't working and I should stop using fluid. Because the, the last thing they want is sewage coming back into their home without a warning having been given for days or weeks ahead of time that their, their pump is not performing properly. So thank you guys for answering that trick question. And uh, now we're gonna do a little show and tell. So um, again, I'll, I'll leave this open for just a couple of minutes to see if anybody can tell me uh, problems that they see here. Um, there's two right off the rip that I can, I can see. Uh, the one thing that don't worry about is the color coding of the wires. This is actually an old school 2000 series install. Um, so you'll see black L1, white L2, as opposed to red L1, black L2. So ignore that. And uh, let's see if we can get anybody pointing out the, uh, the two major problems with this installation. We have no duct seal. Absolutely, great answer. So if I don't have duct seal and I need, I need to use something in a pinch, what can I use? Hey, look at that, you guys got it right. Silence is the answer, nothing. Um, if you don't have duct seal, don't put anything in that hole. Silicone is incredibly bad. Don't use liquid nails, don't use spray foam insulation. And if I had unlimited amount of time today, I would tell you my bad dad story about 
um, using hand soap to try to clean off spray foam installation insulation for my hands um, I didn't read the bottle but uh, nothing is the appropriate answer come back in a day or two once you get the right stuff then then putty the hole in um, the second problem if we didn't have an answer will we have back penetration perfect that is the answer so back penetration now um, again I'm going to be talking with two different hats on the E1 hat and the C word hat um, that back penetration can be corrected. There's two ways to correct it, by an entire new panel. That's the hard line approach. Um, and in some cases it's warranted. Um, the less hard line approach, the more flexible and forgiving approach is remove the back penetration, penetrate the panel through the bottom and reroute the wires accordingly. Use a NEMA rated mechanical sealing device that you will source yourself uh, to seal up the back penetration. Then there's no issues, your warranty is not compromised. However, if the, the plug that is used to seal the back ever leaks that will not be covered under warranty so keep in mind the easiest way to avoid heartache is don't penetrate it anywhere but the bottom of the panel box and use your duct seal all right on to backfill so you know, i usually have like 15 pictures of show and tell but that one was a good one and that illustrates the two major problems that uh, we see constantly on panel installs is the improper penetrations and the lack of duct seal um, from backfill uh, methodology, uh, we want to surround the unit to grade using the class one or class two, compact and one foot lifts. Pretty boilerplate. Um, again, the only heartache and hesitation we've ever had uh, from customers, contractors, installers is the cost. Um, bid your projects accordingly and you won't have to worry about it. Uh, we'll get that proper material in and the customer understands using the proper backfill is going to increase their life and decrease their, their maintenance costs. Um, it should be a no-brainer for all of us. So this is actually old. They're, they combined class 1A and class 1B into just class 1 and class 2. So this is just descriptions um, explaining what each class means. Um, so the class 1, again, we talked about frost heave uh, very lightly earlier. Uh, and then class 2, again, may require more compacting. But both are absolutely um, equivalent in terms of uh, backfill material for E1 stations. And then this one, I, I don't see a lot of people doing it, the uh, low slump or flowable fill. And I mean, the biggest problem here is that you gotta be careful with the height in which you drop it from, because if you drop it from too high of a height, more than four feet, then uh, you can get the, the materials to separate out into the constituent materials. So now it's not gonna cure properly. and It's not going to create that uh, backfill environment that we need. And uh, I didn't put this slide in properly. Um, so there's an installation issue here. And first up is my bad Photoshop. Um, that conduit that you see at the bottom that's connecting to the tank, that actually belongs right here next to the other conduit because uh, that's how I Photoshopped it. Um, this is as close as I've seen in terms of just like real world pictures to a proper installation. Um, I've heard people tell me, oh, the, uh, the gas lines are too close. I don't really have any info on regs for gas lines, but um, this is a proper burial height, pump it panel, direct line of sight. We've got our two conduits, if you can imagine the Photoshop in its proper place, um, just a perfect install. So one to four feet above grade, uh, we're sloping away from the station to provide proper venting and preventing that infiltration. Again, our pumps like moving water. They don't like moving dirt, sand, and grit. That is going to steal life from the pump and create a, uh, a headache for the homeowners downstream. It's going to increase the cost of ownership and, and nobody wants that. All right, some more show and tell. So this is uh, definitely going to be an improper station. Right? It's below grade. So more than likely with the amount of dirt, I don't know what part of the country this is from, that's probably pretty firm dirt. So we're going to have a hard time breathing here. So breathing is a big issue. So venting is restricted. Then obviously uh, groundwater when it rains or just from the water table by itself, we're going to be bringing in dirt and debris through the vent. That's going to steal life from the stator. Now, in normal world, stator means motor. In the E1 world, stator is a rubber boot. And there's a stainless steel rotor that spins inside of this rubber boot. And it pulls up one pocket of fluid at a time. Hence, semi-positive displacement, progressive cavity. So that stainless steel rotor is going to be bringing in a little bit of dirt and water with it. That dirt's going to wear down the rubber. And eventually, we'll lose our, our, our grip. We'll lose our pumping power. So keep it above grade, that keeps the dirt out, and then we don't steal life from the pumping mechanism. 
This one, we probably aren't going to have any problems breathing. It says venting is restricted, but mulch is generally light and airy, so I doubt they're going to be uh, issues breathing. However, this is definitely going to be heavily infiltrated from debris and groundwater to that vent. Now to fix those two problems, six inch riser. Um, this shouldn't take you more than 10 to 15 minutes to install. And again, if you happen to be um, in the winter time and the ground is frozen, all right, you might take a little longer than uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, but we have this available. Generally, every service guy's got them on the truck. And from a sales stocking standpoint, we've got these uh, at request anytime you need it. Um, another little side story, Iowa. I was in Jesus, like four or five places out in Iowa. I think this was Minburn. And uh, this wasn't an installer's fault. It was a homeowner's fault. They decided to change the location of the, the, the tank installation at the last minute. And the installer was trying to bend over backwards to get this customer um, satisfied. So the farther away from the home, now they need a deeper tank, right? To account for the two inch slope or the two degree slope for the, uh, the flow. And the installer had three of these guys, uh, three of these six inch risers, and he needed just about 18 inches. So he figured, oh, I'll just stack them on top of each other. I call it the Big Mac, and I really wish I had a picture of the Big Mac for you. Um, he, he, the installer took it to a super high degree. He siliconed in between each of the three risers and then uh, used duct tape around that. And within three months, the, the soil itself still separated the seams and we were getting massive groundwater and dirt infiltration in. If you need to raise the height more than six inches, there's a 24, so a two foot or a four foot riser, 24 inch, 48 inch, either slip on or flanged extensions that can be used. Again, these are meant to be used only in the event of uh, an, a last minute change. They're not to be planned for. If you know you're gonna need a height adjustment, order the right size tank ahead of time because E1 foam fills those black corrugations. We do that for structural integrity. That way, if we're going for a deeper station, we've got increased pressure from the soil, the soil load itself. And those foam ribs, the foam filled ribs are better able to handle that soil load than just empty uh, HDPE ribs. So. It's not meant to be planned for, it's to be used for emergencies only, and there are limitations even at that point as to how deep you can go. Um, that slide is not in the right spot. Um, so this is one of the uh, things we just talked about, the access way extensions. So uh, again, two foot options, four foot options. They're not meant to be planned on. Uh, they do come with the necessary EQD extensions if you need them, and the vent, uh, the vent extender as well, you can kind of see the vent extender and the 2000 series EQD extensions. So you guys can kind of see what those used to look like. Um, not the new style extreme EQDs there. And from height adjustments, I'm gonna burn through these slides pretty quickly as we're uh, getting pretty close to the 11 o'clock expected finish time. Um, what I really want you guys to take away from these next few slides is every single station has a max height that it can be extended to depending on how tall it was originally ordered. So we'll use this as an example and we'll burn through the next few slides. An 071, so the standard D-series product, like I was telling you in the videos, super common for single family residentials. Generally, the heights are 93 inches total station height or less, which means the max that that can be extended is 120 inches. If it was greater than 93 inches, that means E1 has already foam filled some of these black corrugations, and now we can extend it up to 160 inches. So keep that in mind as we move through. So again, 151 has uh, a couple of different heights, 165, or if it was bigger than 93, you can go up to 200. And then again, little boilerplate note, regardless of initial station height, the max height a duplex station can be extended is 200 inches. And then, uh, Again, a little shameless sales pitch. If you've got customers that uh, don't like the look of the station itself, sell them a rock. Um, these are vented, they come in a bunch of different colors. Um, and honestly, from 10 feet away, they look fairly real. From 20 feet away, you would think that they are. Uh, if you get any closer than 10 feet, then you're gonna get COVID from the tank rock, but uh, just kidding. Um, then you'll know that they're plastic. But. All right, last up is troubleshooting. And again, I know the audience that I'm working with here, so I'm not gonna go too crazy in troubleshooting. Uh, we touched on it before. 
the wire identification. So we know what our, our hot legs are, we know what manual run and our alarm wires are. We know that this is a 240 volt rated system. So if you have the right multimeter, so E1 generally uses a wave tech meter man, uh, AC voltage, make sure you're in an AC scale. We're looking for 240 volts between our two hot legs, L1 and L2. And if you happen to catch a commercial installation, three phase 208, um, obviously this is what it looks like. I'm not an electrical wizard, but I can recognize 208 when I see it. Um, you got to fix it. And to fix it, we're going to be using a buck boost transformer. That just takes one of those high legs, adds 32 volts to it. And then uh, that high leg needs to be on our L2. But again, that's a little more in depth than we need to go for now. That gets us the 240 volts that the station needs to properly perform. So this is the uh, the meter that E1 uses, the WaveTech meter mans. I think they're uh, 100 and something bucks. And again, we don't care where you get them from as long as you have the proper tools to do the job that you're doing. Um, it needs an AC voltage scale. And then from a continuity standpoint, um, you're going to need the, uh, the 2000K or 2M scale. So the next few slides are just going to tell us where we're doing checks. Uh, incoming is, uh, so it's 11 o'clock now. Um, and looks like I've got about 10 slides to go. Um, I'm going to park right here and see uh, Will, Sherry, you guys want to hop on and see if everyone will give another five minutes or if we need to do a hard stop. Yeah, I think we're good with another five minutes. Okay. Like I said, I'm not going to go over in depth, but uh, I just wanted to show you guys real quickly with the proper meters. Here's how we're going to check voltage incoming and outgoing from the main breakers. Again, easy answer is right at the bottom of the screen. We're looking for 240 volts. If you find anything that's outside of this voltage range, stop. Call Seawirt for help and we're gonna recommend the next course of action. Either install a buck boost transformer or check your main breakers, etc. Next checks are to make sure that the circuit board itself is seeing 120 volts. So the most important one is this third check, neutral to the alarm feed. You got 120 volts there, you're done, walk away. You're great, your alarm circuit has power. We don't need to do any other voltage checks. If we don't have 120 volts here, we need to stop and figure out why. More than likely it's no neutral or bad neutral or potentially the jumper, this guy slipped out. And again, if you can't rectify the voltage situation, give us a call and we'll be happy to help you. So we talked about the 240 volt voltage checks and what happens if we run into three phase, we use that buck boost transformer. Um, this is generally what it looks like. Here's a flavor of it. Uh, see where we use a different one, um, but buck boosts all do the same thing. Um, they have a specific uh, KVA rating for each station, a simplex is 0.5 and a duplex is 0.75. Um, as long as we're using a proper buck boost style transformer, we can raise 208 to the appropriate 240 and then the station is completely fine. Jim, we have a question. Yes, sir. Is, will a buck booster fit in the panel or install it at the source? Uh, it will not fit inside of the panel. This buck boost that E1 likes is, I believe, about six inches by eight inches, maybe a little bit bigger than that. Um, so it would be mounted between the main disconnect and the E1 panel or even before the, the, the customer's main disconnect. Uh, doesn't really matter so long as the that the E1 alarm panel sees the appropriate 240. Um, generally though, I see it after the 30 amp disconnect, the 30 amp dedicated breaker and before the E1 alarm panel. Definitely will not fit inside. Yes, but we have had instances where people do it near the main panel to feed a couple different stations. So we can help you to size and select the right buck boost for the application. And this was where we uh, mentioned, make sure the black wire, so your L2 leg, um, sees the high volt because we are adding 32 volts of power to one of the legs and the board has a voltage rating of 120. So if we put the 152 volt high leg on that circuit board, you're gonna be pushing it above its max rated capacity of 132 and those little orange relays uh, you'll eventually see them burn out. There'll be a little black dot in the center and that black dot will grow over time. Um, I've seen it generally takes like a little over a year before the relays finally burn out, but I mean, it could happen a lot faster. Uh, next up, same meter, the WaveTech uh, meter man, uh, but now we're going to do continuity checks. So this two scales, if you screenshot this picture or just scribble down these numbers, you need these scales. 
Uh, we don't like auto rangers because it uh, we we start to have a translation issue. Uh, you guys are giving us auto ranging readings, and we're reading a book that tells us the two M scale it should be X, Y, and Z. Um, it takes a little bit of time to translate your auto range readings into um, hard readings that the book is pointing out. So if you guys have a scale that you can set manually or just pick up a dial indicator meter, and again, these aren't very expensive, um, you can actually get a green one like Harbor Freight for 30 bucks. The problem with those is it's not fused. So the first time you forget to turn power off and you do a continuity check, there goes your meter, it becomes a paperweight. So again, this just shows a couple of the um, ways that meters show open loops, OL or one, overload, whatever you want to call it. And inside the E1 Extreme Series uh, service manual has these scales, uh, these tables that tell us here are the readings that we're looking for and what we expect those readings to be in normal operation. So again, everything is color coded with numbers next to it. And again, guys, I really apologize for speaking so quickly during this part. Uh, I don't want to shortchange you. So if you wanted more information on this, please reach out to any of us at Seawirt and we'll, uh, we'll slow down a bit and recap this for you. Um, but like Will said, there'll be more presentations going forward and we can focus any area that you guys would like us to. Um, back to the table. These are color coded with numbers as well. So numbers are used in the EQD to do pin checks and the colors obviously correspond to what the color of the wire inside the panel box is. Um, these two wires together, so think of it like um, yellow and blue, right? These two technically make a new color, green. Um, green, the, these two individually have a function, and then together they make something else. Um, so think about that when you're pairing up two colors. Brown and red together make an on-off switch. Yellow and blue together make an alarm switch. And this tells us what reading we're expecting. And if we don't get that reading, this is an incredibly important table. If wrong, look here. It's almost like a get-out-of-jail-free card. And again, once you guys get to this point and you're doing continuity checks on site and you run into a problem, we're here for you. Give us a call. We'll give you additional checks to do. Or if you need on-site support, we'll be there. Two tables, one in water, one out of water. And then, like I said, there was numbers on those corresponding tables to allow us to do the same exact checks at the panel that we can do inside of the electrical quick disconnect as well. And then last up, uh, again, this is kind of like the, the final functionality test um, on a post-installation kind of pre-startup check is we want to see if uh, the pump is actually moving fluid efficiently. So we're going to do an amp check. We're going to use the L2 wire, and I generally don't call out the color, but these days most of them are, are the black wire. So the black wire is L2. Uh, we're going to clamp the amp meter on it, turn breakers on, and run the pump for about uh, five to ten seconds. And there needs to be fluid in this tank, right, in order to do this, because we don't want to drive on the pump. Um, and again, it helps a little bit if you know the, the system that you're working in to tell what a good amp draw actually is. So five amps to eight amps is the full range of normal expected running. Eight is bad, and so is five. Um, like I said, generally earlier, uh, 20 PSI is a, a pretty common force main pressure, and we would expect to see high fives to low sixes. If you know you got a 20 PSI force main and we're running at seven amps, that's an indication that there's something going on in the system or the station that's not necessarily good for the pump and the product. Um, so the more you know about your the system layout, the better we'll be able to use that amp draw to assist us. Um, this is just a quick little snapshot of, um, of the NSF test, uh, the grind test that the E1 pumps get put through, um, just a few things that go through. And then, uh, Past that, past what we're grinding up, um, this actually shows us what the expected force main pressure is and what we should see in terms of an amp draw. So like I said, if you know you're in a 20 PSI force main, we should be seeing about 5.8 amps. If you know you're you know, right in the high end of the spectrum, 60 PSI force main, we expect to see a good bit higher amp draw. Um, and again, tells us our gallons per minute output. And then if we're starting to get bad readings, like if we're on a 20 PSI force main, and we're at 4.9 amps, well, maybe we've got a worn stator or a run dry situation. Again, a little disclaimer at the bottom. Um, these are approximants only, not meant to be used for like full system specking. And last slide is just uh, thanking you guys for taking a few minutes um, out of your schedules to, to tune into our webinar. Like Will said, we're gonna be hosting more of these. We are more than willing to, uh, to 
let you guys pick the topics and we can pull together an hour or two hour presentation pretty much whenever you need it. Um, just give us a little bit of time uh, and heads up so that way we can prepare a presentation, get some invites out for you. And uh, again, I'll turn it over to Will to, uh, to do final comments and see if there's any last minute questions that are rolling through the presentation that uh, we wanted to circle back and close up on. Thank you, Jim, and congratulations, everyone. You're now level one E1 certified installers. If you want to move on to level two, send me an email at willstradling at seawardequipment.com and we will get you more information. Thank you again, and please do not hesitate to email or call if you have any questions or need any additional information. Have a great day. Anything come through in the chat box? Nope. All right. Well, again, like uh, like Will said, thank you guys. And uh, to do that level two installation test, make sure you reach out to us, and then we'll get uh, we'll take care of getting your account information created through E1. And then uh, once we get that info, we'll send it back to you, and we'll walk you through how to do the uh, the quick little uh, twenty question certified installer exam. Um, uh, I guess spoiler alert: the average time to take that test is about four minutes. So um, it's it's not a brain game. It's not a, a, a knowledge check. We want to make sure that you know how to use the book efficiently. That's really all you got to do. Um, and thank you guys again, and have a great rest of your day.